My name is Pastor Darren Earlywine. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Mercy Road Northeast, and we're so excited to have you with us this morning. We know that the past, you know, maybe six months or actually the past like three weeks, there's been a lot of you that are brand new to Mercy Road Northeast. And so I uh, wanted just a quick intro. You may be like, okay, we're coming here, checking it out, not sure what's going on, want to kind of know what the deal is. Well, Mercy Road Northeast is a part of Mercy Road family of churches. And right now there are four Mercy Road churches and we've been around for just about a decade. A guy named Josh Hoosman uh, is, a, is the founding pastor of Mercy Road. He moved from California with the vision to, uh, to come back to, he grew up in Indiana, come back to Indiana to, pl- uh, to plant this church. And so about a decade ago, he started Mercy Road uh, Carmel. We were at 116th and Keystone over there. And uh, the vision wasn't just for one church. The vision from the beginning was to plant multiple churches all over the state. And so uh, in just a few short years, uh, the, the church grew to the point where it was ready to plant a church. And so we planted Mercy Road Northwest, which if you're ever driving on 465 and you go over to like 465 and 421, kind of Michigan Road area, look to the right. If you're going west, you'll see Mercy Road Northwest. Shortly after we launched that location, <clears throat> we launched Mercy Road Downtown. And Mercy Road Downtown meets down the Antheneum Downtown. And uh, one of the unique things about Mercy Road Churches is it's not like buildings where they you know, just crank in a video of, of, of one guy preaching. Every church is, will eventually become its own legal entity church, their own worship pastors, their own staff. And the idea there is that as a church, we don't want to like be a church where we're just following like the teaching of one dude and it's kind of a personality thing. Uh, we want to actually have places where there are churches that are in local communities making a difference and growing and developing people in the kingdom. And so 19 months ago, basically, I think it was, we launched Mercy Road North Northeast here in the middle of the pandemic, which wasn't a great strategy, but uh, God had a plan, I guess. And, uh, and we've been growing ever since. And one of the things that we're really excited about is Mercy Road Northeast is we will be a big part of launching Mercy Road Anderson next year, which will be the fifth church in the Mercy Road family of churches. Yeah. And I, I told first service this, and I want to tell you guys, this is probably a little known fact for most people, but I just want you to know, I'm telling you all this because if you're brand new, I want you to know the heart of, of what you're getting into, if this is the, the church you want to join and be a part of is, we did a, a, a fundraising campaign about three years ago called the Compassion Campaign, and the goal was to raise, I think about $3 million, just to maybe just a little north of $3 million. And as a part of that plan, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars that were earmarked to come here to Northeast to help us launch and, and grow and do what we needed to do at this location. And earlier this year, or like last year, I think it was, there was it, recently, the board and, and the leadership of this location made a decision to actually forego the money that was supposed to come here so it could go to what's going on in Anderson, right? And, and you may not know that, maybe you don't need to know it, but what I, I, I tell you, because I want you to know the heart of, of what we're trying to do at Mercy Road Northeast. Is it's not like we're the deal, we grow it, we keep all the money we have. Like that money was supposed to be ours to do some things around here. But we said, you know what's more important right now? God is blessing what we're doing here. We're okay. We're going to be okay. What we want to be a part of is from the get go, from the drop here, right? We want to be about a church that's about multiplying the kingdom of God. And, and I'm excited about that. And that's what we do at Mercy Road. Uh, all the families of churches and, um, we, we want to live boldly for Christ. We want to love deeply other people. And one of the things you'll hear us say often here at, at Northeast is that we want our church to be a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And it's that heartbeat that we feel like we, we receive from Jesus. And today we're going to finish this three-week uh, series we've been doing, coming home, started it around Easter, right? And looking at this story in Luke chapter 15, where Jesus is really trying to help people understand the heart of God. He's trying to get them to understand the heart of his father. And that's so important to us uh, at Mercy Road. And and I hope it's important to you. And what I want to share with you guys today, I think for me, was one of the more transformational understandings about God uh, that I ever learned to completely change the trajectory of my understanding of my connection with God about 15 years ago. And so I hope that, that, that it does the same for you. Um, because it it truly did transform my life. And basically, here's what it comes down to. It's this. It's coming to the place where you understand what it means to live loved by God. To live loved. Because that's what the story really is. We've been walking through the story in in Luke chapter 15, and and a lot of times you hear it called the the story of the prodigal son. 
And there are these two sons, right? And in, in Easter, we walk through the, the, the younger son. And then last week, Ken walked us through the, the understanding of the younger, the older son. And now I'm going to talk about the father. But honestly, I feel like the story would be better actually described, not as the prodigal son, but as the loving father. That's what this story is. It's the story of the loving father. It's not the story of the prodigal son. And I hope that's what you gain today. And we're going to do something old school. I'm old school, okay, because I grew up in the church. I've been going to church since before I was born, okay? Some of you may have that same situation, okay? And, uh, and when I was a kid, what we used to say is my dad was a preacher, and he would always say, let's stand for the reading of God's word. And it was, uh, it, was, it was good to show respect to God's word, and it felt good to stand up. And he may have actually just said it to make sure people didn't fall asleep. I don't know. But let's stand up today for the reading of God's word. We're going to read Luke chapter 15. I'm reading for the message paraphrase, and it goes like this. Then he said, Jesus speaking here, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. Contextually, don't forget what's happening here is Jesus is, is being surrounded by a bunch of religious-minded people who are sad at him that he's got the heart of God. They're sad that he's been hanging around with sinful people so much. So they're bringing a lot of hate and a lot of shade his way. And he says, okay, here's the deal. Let me give you three stories about the heart of God so you understand who I am and what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. This is the third of those three stories. So the father divided the property between them and it wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. And after he'd gone through all of his money, there was a bad famine all through that country, and he began to feel it. He signed on with the citizen there who assigned him his fields to slop pigs. This is bad. Jewish kid with pigs against the culture. Things are going really poorly in this guy's life. He was so hungry, he would have eaten the corn cobs and the pig slop, but no one would even give him any. And that brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned, against, I've sinned before you, and I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. And he got up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounded, and he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants. Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress and put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get the prize winning heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time, the older son was out in the field. And when the day's work was done, he came in and as he approached the house, he heard the music and he heard the dancing calling over one of the house boys, he says, what is going on? And he told him, your brothers come home. Your father's ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stomped off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you a moment of grief, but you've never thrown a party for me and my friends. Then the son of yours, who's thrown away your money on a horse, shows up, and you go out with an all-out feast. His father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time, and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time, and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and he's found. Jesus, I pray that you'd open this word to our minds, to our hearts, to our spirits, that it would um, inform, that it would transform us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. You can see. As we look at the story, I think it's probably easier for us to find ourselves more closely connected to one of the brothers than it is the father. And what I hope to do today is to invite all of us, and whether we see ourselves in the younger or we see ourselves more in the older, to begin the process of seeing ourselves more through the eyes and the heart of the father. See, some of us, we may be uh, more like the younger brother. We could identify ourselves maybe a little more around this track of rebellion, right? We're not sure about God. We're not sure what's happening over in that kind of thing, but we're choosing kind of our own deal. We're kind of the rebellious one. Maybe we've always been that. Maybe we're more like a little more of an Enneagram 7, maybe Enneagram 8, right? Our personality is more like this is my jam, doing things I probably shouldn't do, okay? 
I can see some of your expressions. Some of you have a, a little, little smirk on your face because you're like, that's true. Okay. Now, others, you're more on this side. You're more older brother people, right? You've been following the rules since before you were born, right? They said you were going to be born on the 28th. You were born on the 28th exactly when they said you were going to be born, right? It was your younger brother that came out breach all crazy, right? But like you were born the way you were supposed to be born. You've been following the rules from day one. You might be a type one, type nine, maybe type six of the Enneagram, right? Rules are to be followed. They bring you safety and comfort and wonderfulness. And you're over here. And you can sometimes tend to think you might be better than those morons over there because you're doing it right, right? Here's the thing. The father is not really interested in rebellion or religion. The father's in this middle road and what he is trying to do is to invite both of his children to return back to relationship. See, because this may be the more respectable road, but it's still a road that is running away from God. I'm really not in deep relationship with God. I'm just following the rules to keep him at bay. Over here, I'm, I'm not really interested in a relationship with God. I'm just not following the rules to keep God at bay. You see, the heart is the same. The actions are different. Over here, I'm, I'm breaking the rules thinking that his judgment is going to keep me away. Over here, right, I'm following the rules. Actually, it's the same thing. Because I'm afraid if I don't, his judgment will, hmm. Hmm. If you just realize you're on one of these roads, you're in good company. It doesn't mean that you're a terrible person or a dirty sinner or uh, you know a stingy, you know, crumbs, you know, kind of crusty, older, churchy person, right? <laughs> I didn't know where I was going there. Words had they were just coming out of my mouth there. What it means is you're a human being. That's what it means. You're, you're a human being, and guess what? Human beings from day one of human beinging have been doing the same thing. Adam and Eve were in the perfect paradise, heaven on earth, garden of Eden, in a situation, relational connection with God. The devil comes and says, hey, you don't wanna be on a relationship and trust him to care for you. He's holding out on you. He knows you could be like a God. And they go, yeah, sounds like a good idea. Let's rebel. The entire Old Testament is basically God's people choosing one of these paths in him for the entire Old Testament. And it's a lot of the Bible saying, I am faithful and loving and I want to redeem. I want to welcome you back. Stop rebelling and running away from me. I love you. Here's the New Testament. The New Testament was God said, okay, this isn't working. I'm going to actually come myself and give my life so that we can realize that I'm no longer keeping score on sins. I'm gonna actually, it's, it's finished. I've removed that. So now everyone, it's very simple. You just return home to my love. And that, that, that's what I hope that we get our minds around today because this life over here is not what you were meant for. And this life over here, it's not what you were meant for. This week, or this month, Pastor Ken, our, our lead pastor, found this awesome book by Henry Nowen, and we've been reading it together. And uh, pray for Pastor Ken. Uh, he's at home, because uh, about 48 hours ago, everything that was inside of his body decided to leave it. And uh, so his organs and blood are okay. I don't mean, yeah, like he still has a spleen, right? I'm just saying, you get it, like this area, right? Was, it was like, everything must go, okay? So, but he's fine, he'll be, he'll be good, he'll be good. Um, but wash your hands, because that, maybe that's going around, okay? It's a, it hit our house this weekend, our, our 15-year-old Ty, he, he, had a bad, he had a bad 24 hours yesterday. You know what's funny though? My wife and I were discussing this last week. How many of you guys have kids five and under? Five and under, okay? Yeah, let me tell you something. How many of us have like 15-year-olds, teenagers, right? This is cool. 
When you have a five-year-old and they start throwing up, call everybody, shut down your day, it's ruined. The whole weekend is over, okay? I don't care what plans you had, now you have plans of cleaning up the throw up that they don't get to the toilet to get to, right? When you have a 15-year-old, here's how it works. They wake you up at five in the morning and say, mom, dad, I just threw up eight times. And you go, oh man, that sucks. You don't, you go take them a cold washcloth, you know what I mean, for the back and the neck, right? And then you go in about every 30 minutes and they're on the bathroom floor and you're like, you still, you're not dead? You're good? Okay. Did it happen again? That sucks. I'm sorry. Hey, pour some Clorox bleach in that toilet after you do it. <laughs> pour it in, let it sit and then flush it. Yeah. Okay. We'll text you, right? And then, and then you go to the South side and coach baseball for four hours, right? It's, it's how it works. And then you tell them afterwards, you know, hey, maybe some saltines, right? Huh? Hey, let's be honest with each other. After you've had a throw up bout, is there anything more godly and wonderful than saltines and some 7-Up? You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like a Ruth Chris steak. Once you can get that saltine and some 7-Up, that's the best saltine I've ever had in my life. Anyway, we're preaching, aren't we? Sorry, all right. So pray for my son, your son. Once again, wash your hands. Something weird going around, okay? Henry Nowen, that's what we were talking about, because Ken's throw, not, he's not throwing up anymore. He's eating saltines at home. But um, this, coming back to this, I'm going to read you guys some quotes from this book from Henry Nowen. It's amazing. Talking about the heart of the Father, he says this, Here is the God I want to believe in, a Father who from the beginning of creation has stretched out his arms in merciful blessing, never forcing himself on anyone, but always waiting, never letting his arms drop down in despair, <clears throat> but always hoping that his children will return so that he can speak words of love to them and let his tired arms rest on their shoulders. His only desire is to Bless. Here's the deal. That last sentence, for some of you that are on this road, you didn't like that sentence. In fact, you read, his only desire is to bless, and then your religious guy in your or girl in the back of your head said, well, I can tell you a few other things that are on God's heart, like his hate for sin, or something like that. His only desire is to bless. What about some consequences, Darren? You're saying God's okay with sin. He's okay with these morons over here ruining their life. They could be following rules over here. They don't need blessing. Tell you what they need. Some good old-fashioned punishment. Okay. My problem with this story of the loving father is that when he has ample opportunity to punish both the children who are rejecting him, give me my money so I can party, right? This guy says this. This guy says, you know what? I'm just here following the rules. Just, honestly, I just want you to be dead too so I can maybe finally throw my own party. The thing that gets me is that he doesn't respond with anger and condemnation to either of them. And in the story, he runs out after them both. We talked about it on Easter. He runs out to meet the old younger son out before the gates of the city. This one, the other son, the younger son, the older son won't come into the party. And he leaves the party, embarrasses himself, and runs out to that one and, and says, Would you just come back home? He has no desire to punish them his children, because they have already been punished excessively by their own inner and outer waywardness. This is from now and again. The father wants simply to let them know that the love they have searched for is in, in such distorted ways has, has been, is, and always will be there for them. He has no desire to punish you because he knows that you've already been punished excessively by your outer or inner waywardness. This quote flipped the script for me a couple years ago when I read it, it said this, we're not punished for our sins, but by them. 
You see, in my parenting with my three boys, I've never wanted to play the role of the punisher. We don't punish a lot in our family. My wife and I were talking the other day, we're like, when's the last time we grounded the kids? I, I don't remember. And it's not that our kids are like angels, but we made a decision early on in, in our parenting that we didn't want to play the role of punisher, but as actual wise guide into teaching them how to live life as life was desired and created by God to be lived. And so we've had to make the decision of there could be a strong punishment that comes here. But if all I do is focus on punishment and what they did wrong, but I don't spend any time in helping them discover why they did it, we will not have a transformational relationship. We'll have a relationship that's seated in fear and shame. And, and, and what will happen is when they screw up, they will not come to me for wisdom. They will run away from me because they're afraid of punishment. That's just how we've done it. You can parent how you want. This isn't a parenting class. This is just us looking at how God parents us. Because what God seems to do is he says, here's the deal. How about we don't lie? One of the big 10. Let's not lie. Then does he says, because if you do, I can't wait to punish you. You lie, I can't wait to curse your life. No, he doesn't say that. He says, don't lie. And we could say, why? And he would say, because the consequences of you lying is no one will trust you. And then your relationships will implode on themselves and your life is relationships. And I, I have created you for love and relationship. And I want you to be able to live with peace and patience and kindness and goodness. And so truth telling is gonna allow you to actually have the greatest life possible. Well, I wanna lie, what are you gonna do about it? I'm going to let you lie and then enjoy the fruits and consequences of your decisions. Are you gonna punish me? Is that what you're gonna do? God, mad because I'm a liar? No, I'm not actually mad at you. It actually breaks my heart to see you dealing with what you're creating for yourself. And what I'd love to have you do is come back home in a relationship where we can actually show you how to tell the truth in life. Right? <clears throat> hey, um, God says, hey, how about we don't envy? other people's and covet other people's stuff. Oh, what? Because you don't want me to have nice stuff? I can't have a nice car? Like my neighbor has a nice car? Is that the deal, God? You're going to keep holding out on me? Uh, no, no, I'm not. <clears throat> I don't want you to covet or want their stuff because it's going to cause you to act like this, right? And then you're going to overwork yourself. You're going to go into debt that you can't hold. And, and then you're going to be anxious and depressed and, and stressed out all the time. And you'll never actually be able to enjoy the peace of contentment. And I actually want you to understand contentment. Well, you know what? That's what I want. I'm a driven kind of person. That's how it's going to be, God. What are you going to do? Punish me? No, I'll, I'll, if you want, I'll just allow you to live in stress and overwhelming depression and debt. Are you going to send me to hell? No, I'll just actually allow you to live in the hell you're creating. Oh. Or what I'd really love is just for you to come back home. Could we just be in a relationship and you can understand that I don't have a desire to punish you. I just want you to understand what it looks like to live loved. And understand that Everything you've been searching for in distorted ways has been, is, and will always be here for you in our love. That's the story of the loving father. Hmm. <clears throat> consequences are one thing, punishments are other. God allows consequences. He's not interested in punishment. Do you have a heart like that yet? Where you see other people and you go, my only desire is to bless them. <laughs> I hope we do. You know when we don't? When there's construction, okay? <laughs> you know when you're in construction and there's the merge lane, you know? And, and these people, you get in line early. You know what I mean? Hey, there's a lane merge coming up for construction in six miles. It'd be good if we got in the right-hand lane now. <coughs> and then these morons over here, these rebellious people, right? They're the people that zoom up next to you and merge to the last minute, right? 
And your reaction to that moment lets you know how much of God's heart you actually have inside of you, right? Yeah, 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 if you're the moron, actually, you know what? I did do some research. I do tend to be on this side of the equation. The actual proper way for merging is just to keep rolling and then we all just kind of move together. The issue is everybody that's gotten line six miles ago, but that's not this sermon. We're gonna keep moving, okay? <laughs> But when that person goes past you, if you say, you know what, bless you, you need to get to where you're going quicker than I do, probably your wife's pregnant. Bless them, right? Or when they pass you, go, Lord in heaven, give them a ticket and a big one, right? May they hit a pothole and blow out a tire in Jesus' name, right? That's how you know how close to the heart of God you are, okay? <clears throat> Here's what happens. It is, and we got to understand this story, is we get into a comparison game. And the reality is this, is comparisons kill us. Comparisons kill us because what happens is in a comparison, there's always a winner and always a loser. So either you lose and feel shame or you win and feel arrogance. That's really the two options. And God says, I, I'm actually not keeping score and there's not a comparison game. The problem with this story was the young, young, older brother got mad because he thought he was being loved less. Right? We're comparing what's going on. I'm not loved. Oh, you don't love me as much as you love him. We're making a comparison. I'm rejected. He's accepted. What's the deal here? Because what's really difficult for us to get our minds around is this, is that God's love, right? God's love, it, it, it's unfair, and his generosity is ridiculous. Isn't it? Like it says, unfair. And for us to love like God, we have to get to the place where we go, I will accept unfairness. Love is unfair. And God's generosity is ridiculous. Here's some more truth from Henry Nouwen. This is good. You're going to like this one. The elder son's dilemma is to accept or reject the father's love and that it's beyond comparison. To dare to be loved as his father longs to love him or to insist on being loved as he feels he ought to be loved. Will the elder son be willing to kneel and be touched with the same hands that touched his younger brother? Let me ask you the billion dollar question today, friends. Will you dare to be loved as your father longs to love you? Or will you insist on being loved how you think you ought to be loved? Because see, this is where comparison comes in. Because if you're over here, you know how you ought to be loved. Have you not seen how hard I've been working, God, for you? <clears throat> I was nice to them. I forgave that other person. I've done this and this and this and this. I'm going to tell you how I ought to be loved, God, in this situation with my health or with my kid or my job or whatever I'm going to. <clears throat> it's not what I ought to get because I've been doing it right But my, my love for you wasn't ever based on how much you were doing right. See, I'm not keeping score. I'm just inviting you into a relationship. And this side over here, it's so hard for us sometimes on this side to actually believe in the out of control, reckless, generous love of God that he's not going to love us as we ought to be loved. Because God, listen, I look at all the stuff I've done and been done and, and have done and the stuff I probably will do and I'm thinking about doing now, all of this stuff, you should reject me, you should be, be done with me and I just can't get my mind around that you would actually love and forgive me. Yeah, I know, but say I wasn't actually keeping score. Because see, what I did with my, with my son, Jesus, is, is we obliterated the scoreboard of sin counting and, and it's forgiven. And so now I can actually welcome you both home to just live loved. 
and realize that everything that you were looking for and everything that you were looking for, it's always been, will always be right here. See, comparison kills, and it gets me really concerned about what we're seeing in culture. And um, <clears throat> one of my mentors sent me this about teenagers right now. We got a lot in the front row. I'm so stoked this summer, guys. The first uh, uh, NTS camp, Never the Same Camp, is a camp that teens can go to. I'm actually the, the, fe- the speaker this year and our, uh, of the week that our teens are going to. If you have kids that are going into sixth grade all the way through high school, and you're not signed up to go to camp yet, uh, think about signing them up and, and let's go to camp together. It's going to be great, uh, a great week. It'll be, it'll be life-changing. But there's a new study that just came out by the CDC. And from 2009 to 2021, the share of American high school students who say they feel persistent sadness or hopelessness rose from 26% to 44%. This is the highest level of teenage sadness ever recorded. The government survey of almost 8,000 high school students conducted in the first six months of 2021 found a great deal of variation in mental health among different groups. More than one in four girls reported they had seriously contemplated attempting suicide during the pandemic. This was twice the rate of boys. The problem seems to originate from not feeling that their lives are filled with as much meaning and shared experience as their peers. Fueled in part by their phones and social media, today's teens are constantly exposed to people who are seemingly prettier, smarter, funnier, and stronger than they are. To further the damage, very personal terms that used to be vague like friends, likes, and seen are now quantified, measured, and displayed for the world to see. In other words, we have quantified terms associated with human worth. See, this is the world we live in. And we just spent the last two years in some ways isolating and locking our teens in their rooms with their phones to keep them safe. And now they're suicidal because they don't know how to live a life outside of comparison with the person who has completely curated a picture to make you think that their life looks like this. And what teens need in this community is they need hundreds of us, followers of Jesus, that are very set on this path. So when they're living a life of comparison and always find themselves losing, when we walk with them and we come into their life, we can let them know you are loved just as you are. God has created you on purpose and for a purpose. He's for you, not against you. He's near you, not for you. And you are not your likes, your clicks, or whatever else you are. You are God's child, right? That could be our gift to our school system and to our world as people that are learning to live loved. We're gonna wrap up because I just burned up two minutes of your time that was my, that your time that I stole time. So let's, let's close with this. Inevitably, you're, 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 you live a little more on this road or you live more on this road. What I hope you see from this story in the past three weeks together is that we have an amazing heavenly father. His generosity is ridiculous. His love is completely unfair, but it's divine. And if you're on this road, I don't know the exact specific way that you get here. Here's what I do know is that God is very personal. And he said he sent his Holy Spirit that if you ask him to guide you into truth, he will guide you. One of the first steps is if you've never actually come into a place of a relationship with God, okay, is you, you just admit, hey, God, I, I'm tired of running. I'd like to come home. I receive your forgiveness, and I want a relationship with you. I give you my life. And you might be over here, and you've been, you're still running from God. You're just doing it through rules. And I don't know exactly how you get here, But the Holy Spirit does. And if you're walking with him, a great question would be, hey God, what are the steps I need to take to start actually living loved every day, all day, for all my days? And when he reveals to you what your next step is, not all the steps, just your next one, you just take it. And then from then on, the rest of your life, you do this. You ask God, God, what are you saying to me today? 
And then you answer that question with, what am I going to do about it? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this truth. I thank you for this amazing story, Jesus, that you told 2,000 years ago. And I thank you that it's not just some story, but it's an amazing example of the Father's love that you wanted us to understand. And so I pray this morning, and whichever road we're running down to, to, to hide from you, to distance from you, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us the courage, the humility to accept your invitation to come home, to walk in relationship with you. I pray that you would reveal to us what does it mean for us to live loved. I pray that we would do so, and by doing so, we would begin to see the world and the people in our lives through your eyes and with your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.